What's up, college baseball fans? Welcome to another episode of the 11.7 podcast. We are here on Masters Thursday, right in the afternoon. Looks like they just started. Uh, I got on the TV next to me. I might be a little distracted, um, but I'm always down to watch some Masters golf. It's like one of three tournaments I watch all year. Jack is heavily invested as well. Um, I can say we both are. And um, basically, Jack took the worst bet or investment that I've ever seen. He took no hole in ones. So as you guys are watching the Masters on and off, please be rooting for hole in ones because I, I, I already gave Jack so much crap for like who bets no hole in one. That's the least exciting thing of all time. Hypothetically speaking, this may have been a mistake. It's kind of like betting the under in the Super Bowl when you're not really like, you know, totally like give a damn about who's playing. Every single par three, ladies and gentlemen, I am pretty much shitting my pants. <laughs> oh man, but it's gonna make uh it's gonna make the adrenaline rush for real. No Dimitri on this episode, as you guys can probably already see if you're on our YouTube. Uh he is landed safely in Italy. Uh, no Wi-Fi set up yet. So Jack and I are going to be running the Club Bromaha type show here today. A little bit off script. We have some things we want to talk about, but it might just end up being story time slash making hot takes for the weekend. The um, The cool thing is we do have a team of the week so far. Uh, our home field apparel team of the week is none other than the vintage USC Trojans look. Big midweek win uh, this week against UC Irvine slaughtered him and it just kind of plays into the i don't know if it's not a stick it's not a bit but dimitri like for some reason hates usc and <laughs> since he's not on the show today we decided to uh crown the trojans as our team of the week so uh first of all i just want to say that the ketchup mustard look that the trojans have especially in the throwback is elite um you know they got some throwback national championship stuff some unique cool logos but this is all at homefieldapparel.com. Uh, I've spent a lot of money on this site recently. I, I started finding teams in the schools tab that, I mean, there's one like Slippery Rock that I had to go buy a shirt from. Uh, never heard of Slippery Rock, but it sounds elite. Um, but yeah, go go use our code. It's uh, promo code CWS24, and you get 15% off your first purchase. Jack, what are your quick thoughts here on this, uh, this USC designs that they have? Here's the the Letterman jacket jumps off the table. I mean, jumps off the screen almost immediately every time for me. I don't know if it's because I wasn't um, smart enough or good enough to go to a school where a Letterman jacket existed. So I'm always kind of drawn to the Letterman guy. But to your point, man, they have some of the better costumes in the country. I, I don't know if it's because they pop or I always think about the Rose Bowl where they rival UCLA always rock their, you know, their color jersey. Um but man, they're strong. And I'll tell you, after getting as much hype as they did early on, and all of us, oh my God, oh my God, they just missed a hole in one by four inches. Oh, we are on hole in one watch. That's why I warned the terrible. listeners first. We this are on hole in one so watch terrible. the whole episode. So hopefully, we get a good live reaction there. Yeah, I mean, if it's going to happen on Thursday, my dream's going to be crushed before we even get to the weekend. Um, but speaking of dreams and aspirations, Southern Cal, who I think, similar to Iowa, got a lot of praise and excitement uh, early on. I think that's where maybe Dimitri, the Riz God himself's hatred started to stem from because we wanted to be a little bit different and contrary in the rest of the college baseball world. But the boys are buzzing. They've won five straight. RPI is still at 92. they got a long way to go. But after winning five in a row, they're eight and two in their last ten. The Trojans are looking kind of dangerous, sitting up top third in the Pac-12 right now. And with Oregon this weekend, we had to make them our home field team of the week because after beating our diaper dandies, the loved ones themselves, the anteaters, you beat UC Irvine. And, I mean, I know it's a mid-major, right, versus a power five. That's an upset. Like, Irvine is so much better than they are. Big time, yeah. So that kind of, I mean, that's got that's got Dimitri kind of eating a bar of soap a little bit. So, and my, ourselves included, I didn't see it coming, but uh, the Trojans are rumbling. Yeah, and they're they're a team. Um, there there might be a lot of listeners that now that college basketball season's over, uh, they're starting to pay attention to college baseball. So they might not have heard our preseason podcast and everything that we were doing. But this was a team that was coming into the season with a lot of hype. Uh, I know the guys over at D one they wrote a few pieces. Andy Stankowitz, head coach over there, is changing the culture. 
people forget this USC program has won, I believe, the most national championships in history. They had a run there in like the 80s and 90s where, uh, I mean, big time names. Uh, Randy Johnson went there. Um, I'm sure there's a few other big name guys I can't even think of right now. But um, but anyways, so like this was a program that coming into the season, they might have been preseason ranked. If not, they were close. And uh, yeah, they started the season ice cold. They looked terrible. I think at one point they were like four and 15. They were not it's good. Weird. They won eight of their last. I mean, we won eight of their last ten, and they just got back to five hundred. Like yeah, exactly. Of the year, so so it's it's just a team to look out for. Um, you know, if they go this weekend and lose two out of three against Oregon, um, you know, they're probably right where they need to be, halfway. You know, halfway in the Pac-12 standings. But if they go and win two out of three against number eighteen Oregon, it's like you're gonna start turning some heads if you're a Trojans fan. Like this team could potentially. Uh, I don't know, get an at-large bid, super regional appearance, maybe talk in Omaha if they just stay hot. This was right around the time last year where TCU surprised everybody and uh, and made that run to Omaha. They turned it on. So we'll see. But, yeah, we wanted to hype up the West Coast. We we, we rarely do that on this show. We try to, but it's mostly the mid-majors out in the, in the Big West. But, anyways, um, Jack, I'm gonna let, I want to let you talk about the midweek because you clipped yourself, and last episode you talked about this felt like the the midweek that there's going to be a ton of upsets and a ton of unranked teams beating ranked teams just because of the dog days of the spring going on right now. Um, these Power Five teams are focused on these intense conference schedules on the weekend and uh, just prime spot to slip up on the midweek. So go ahead and take the floor here. Talk about, what was it, like 13 non-Power Fives beat Power Fives this weekend? Or Sorry, thought- this Tuesday? I've got 14 of them, 12 of which were top 25 guys, right? And just Tuesday, Wednesday. Now, if you're listening at home and you're scoffing and going, okay, Jack, you may have called this week. Well, you've also called every mid mid major upset every Sunday night on all of our podcasts. We can't help ourselves. We're mid major guys. We're mid major junkies. But we did. This one came to fruition. If you bet your $11.70, hypothetical investments, on every midweek that we told you, you are absolutely cleaning up. That's free groceries for at least a month. I'm telling you right now. Let's go through the line. On Tuesday alone, South Alabama, who we have said all year, like they're just like they're brewing, right? It's a really talented group. They go beat Alabama. Kansas beats Nebraska, and you might be like not necessarily a mid-major upset. Nebraska is so much talent, more talented than Kansas. Like it's insane. Like, yeah. Kansas is not very good this year. Um, Sacramento State. Beat Oregon on Tuesday. Oregon's able to even it up on Wednesday. That's a huge upset in the team that we've really liked. Um, again, another kind of I mean, a top 25 upset, but not a power five one. South Carolina went and beat North Carolina in a huge midweek game. And that was I, a I, huge I, midweek. We talked about it, and I felt like everyone is so out on South Carolina, which to me, if I'm a Gamecock guy in that clubhouse, I'm stoked about like It's easier to be the hunter than the hunted. I tweeted that out earlier this week and got a lot of love in Gamecock kind of Twitter corners of the universe because I think that true ride or die understand that, like, if you can just salvage on Sunday, right? Like, they haven't won a ton of series, but it feels like the world is crashing down on a team who had lofty expectations. They're they're 500 in the SEC. Ladies and gentlemen, that's good baseball. Like, I I don't don't really care what you have to say. It's good baseball. That's postseason baseball right there. In, in the formula, crazy. that is postseason baseball. And to beat a North Carolina team who is raking and to hold them to one run on a Tuesday, right? Those are, we've seen some scourgy numbers, man. Like runs galore in these midweeks, especially in the ACC. So the big question mark for the Gamecocks was what does the depth and the, the rotation look like? They go hold one of the best offenses of the country a one run on a Tuesday. They get another win on Sunday against AM. Like those are big back-to-back wins to kind of like fuel your clubhouse. Oh, by the way, they do it with their out their all-American catcher with Messina a little banged up. So uh I was really excited to see them show out in a way where like hopefully they can utilize that as some momentum. I'm not worried about North Carolina, but I think it just said more uh, about the Gamecocks in that game. And it was just a fun game to watch. Low scoring. Like you rarely see low scoring two to one games in the midweek, especially with these gauntlets of an SEC ACC schedule that both of them are battle- battling. Uh, usually you'll see these midweek games between uh, like SEC ACC. It's 10 to eight in the third inning. We saw it with Florida state, Florida, like runs were just being scored over and over again. 
So, um, yeah, it was just a good, clean baseball game. And I know they hold it in Charlotte. Um, awesome stadium. The Brown place could be a little bit better, but that's okay. Um, you know, it was uh, it was enjoyable to watch. But, yeah, on top of that, like, that one kind of slid under the radar because there was so many other games that I was focused on watching. Like, like For example, just across the road, uh, USC Upstate hits a go-ahead grand slam in the eighth <laughs> inning against number two Clemson and wins that game. And although Clemson, we were just bragging on Clemson. Like what's the saying? Like you brag on a dog, he pisses on the carpet or something like that. Um, this game took nothing away in my opinion of Clemson. Like I still think they're a really good team. This was the third time they were uh, facing USC upstate and they beat them bad the first two times. So this was the ideal trap game for Clemson, uh, especially when USC upstate is a good team. Like, preseason unanimous, unanim, unanimously picked to win the Big South. We had them preseason ranked in our mid-major top 25. This is a good team that was just out for blood. Like They had to just go salvage the third game um, of the midweek. They played in two prior midweeks before. But, you know, I was focusing on that game. Obviously, I was watching Florida State beat down Florida, uh, which showed me a lot about Florida State and, like, who they are and how well they're coached. And, um, obviously, like, if you're a Florida Gator fan, You've seen much better times, but there's still plenty of the season left to like figure it out and go on a run. Like the talent is there, but it, it that game showed me more of like how well Link Jarrett has his guys wrangled together and on the same mission. Um, so that was something else that stood out to me in the, in the midweek. I don't know, man. Like I think that I have four screens set up and I can divide two of them. So I think I was playing like five or six games at a time and it was just hard for me to pick exactly which games I wanted to watch. Like there needed to be Mike Rooney and uh, I, I forget the other guy, but the base is loaded squeeze play. Like yep. that's how cool Tuesday was for me. Tuesday was good. And the ACC kind of, they get kind of, they stutter a bit. Like Western Kentucky beat Louisville. UNCW, a team that we've been super high on. Randy Hood's got a stud offense. They go beat NC State in a week that NC State feels like they have to bounce back after they kind of got beat up a little bit yeah. on the road against uh, – they felt like an inferior team in Notre Dame. So the ACC was on watch. But how about Samford? You're a SoCon guy. They go beat yeah. Kentucky, right? Like, I, again, this has less to do with Kentucky. There's your dog pissing on the floor all over again after we praised some love on Kentucky last weekend after we've been kind of quiet on them all year. Uh, Samford's good. Like, I, I yeah. had the opportunity to see him play against Citadel – um, just beat the brakes off of them, like Sanford rakes, and, and they get to throw some of their better arms. Um, really uh, let me good. say one thing about Sanford. It's really cool what they what they did with their schedule. Um, the last three midweeks, they hosted SEC teams. Uh, one week it was Auburn, one week was Mississippi State, and then this past week was Kentucky. Well, they went to extra innings against Mississippi State. They lost. They lost a one-run game to Auburn. And then th I was – so, for example, they were plus three and a half in the game, which means, like, don't lose by more than four runs. Um, also, like, plus 280, I think, money line. And it was just one of those spots where you know, I gave it out to our, our gambling group chat, and even Ben Mintz from Barstool called me and asked what my favorite play was, and I was like, Sanford plus three and a half. They, because I saw them play those two SEC teams earlier in the year at home midweek and how like how much they wanted to win those games in front of the big crowds. Yeah. Um, and you know, they were throwing their better relievers, this and that. And I was like, this just feels like a game where Kentucky's going to sleepwalk through it. They don't realize, you know, how good and talented Sanford is for a mid major. And, uh, you know, Sanford was playing at home in front of a, a big crowd. So like that felt like a safe play and sure enough, they go and win the game. And that was fun towards the end. It was, I believe like the last game I actually watched, uh, on TV. Cause it ended like around 11 PM Eastern. And, um, it's just like it's good to see a team from the SoCon compete and and try to schedule tough. The SoCon's known for very light scheduling at a conference. It's just kind of who we are. But yeah, that was my my takeaway there. They uh, it feels like too like they kind of have to like there's a lot of northeastern schools that'll come down and play in that SoCon spot where like it, it it's an opportunity to not pad the the record books a little bit, but. You kind of go into conference play not knowing, and then all of a sudden you get those midweek games. So to your point, um, it, it was further proof that Sanford's the real deal. Um, 
And, and then to me, there are other teams that former SoCon schools. Like, how about William and Mary? Like, yeah, I, Hey, I, I kind of have jinxed now Duke for like probably the final time I'll back off. I swear boys. Um, but our boy Mason McCray has been letting us know all year. Jump on been board. Chirping us in the group late. message. Jump on board until it's too late. I hope it's not too late. Joe De Los Santos monster in the box. He's at like three fifty five for Bill and the bitch. Uh, they get a huge upset over Duke. But I, there's the real deal, right? And, and and the CAA, who we've bragged on pretty much everybody but William and Mary, hand up. I'm sorry. That's on us. I think they're 23 and 10, 6 and 3 in conference. They've got that, like, hey, we're going to beat you on the mound. But, like, oh, wait, we've got like seven guys in our lineup all hitting over 320. Like, they were yeah. really impressive over Duke as well. It's turned into a bit for 11.7, uh, just messing with Mason every week when he's texting us, like, hey, guys, keep up with the tribe. William and Mary's playing good ball. Like, are they going to be ranked in the mid major poll? And, uh, you know, me and you and Dimitri are always just like, nah, we'll, we'll just wait until next week. They haven't beaten anybody yet. Um, and it's just because we love Mason. And obviously, he's working for the Red Sox now. He, he was working for us for two weeks uh, before he got hired away. <laughs> but, anyways, like, it, it was more of a bit for us to keep them out. And now it's like, all right, they forced our hand. Like they're gonna I be know. in the mid-major poll. They're they're a really good team and a team that um, has improved tremendously from last year. Was not expecting it. Hand up, that's on us. But yeah, I mean, they take down Duke on the road, and it's like, it's like, wow, the CAA is deeper than just Northeastern and um, you know Campbell, uh, UNCW. I mean, Charleston's really good this year, man. Like Charleston's playing good baseball. Um, NCA and T. Coming out of nowhere, beating good teams. Delaware looks really good. So the CAA is not, I don't think as talented as a whole as like a Sun Belt, but pretty equivalent. Like the the East Coast, Northern part of the Sun Belt. That's that's the See, equivalent there. I love that you bring that up. I, I was talking with Chad Holbrook, the, the head coach of um, the College of Charleston on Tuesday. I had the opportunity to be on their broadcast. I, I said it last year doing the CAA tournament. So the CAA tournament gets six teams in. Right, like that's their structure. For that's their where tournament. I met you last year in person. It was love at first sight, man. It I was a you. lot of CAA It was awesome. Tournament. It was on my birthday too, I believe. It was your birthday? I think it was my birthday that day. Yeah. What a bad friend I was that day. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I don't celebrate the birthday. Well, we'll have to run it back with a couple hot dogs again next year. Um, but dude, yeah, that's right. That tournament was loaded, right? You're looking at hey, the CAA as a whole. Yeah. Do you remember us almost got eaten by that snake? Should we tell that story? I've got. Yeah, video let's tell the story. Yeah, All I don't right, think so. we've ever told it on the pod, but I'll let you tell it. Uh, yeah, Jack and I almost got eaten by a snake at the uh, CAA tournament last year. It was awesome. So it's Ben's birthday. Ben, uh, the needle upped in. I'm trying to like show him a good time around the college Charleston ballpark. We're, we're running into a couple teams. I'm in between games, so I'm about to go broadcast like the four o'clock slate. So I'm like, yeah, you got to go meet like the right field renegades. The college Charleston's got a sweet like tailgate spot out in right field. And as we're walking back there, UNCW's in their bullpen, so we're kind of creeping around them, joking around with the boys. And as we creep through the gate to go head out to the tailgate, a like I, I don't want to exaggerate. I don't know, three foot snake, it big I, dude. It looked like a nine foot anaconda. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but yeah, like a, it was probably three to four feet, pitch black, and it's coming out from underneath the turf. I've never dude. seen anything like it. And I guess the turf is built up a little bit, like under wood or something, and it is poking its head out underneath the turf. And Jackson flip flops and walks like right over it. And dude, I see it and I. I thought it was like a moving dog turd. It was just the weirdest <laughs> thing ever. And, uh, dude, I mean, it, it was not happy to see us. But then, dude, it obviously, like, it jumped yeah, at us. But, yeah, it did jump at us. But then, obviously, like, UNCW got a bunch of just like, I don't know, just rednecks on the team, or at least the rednecks that were in the bullpen come out and they, they want to try to like play with it. And I'm like, y'all are crazy. Yeah, they want to like hold it, get some like good turny juju. -choo. I was like, hell no. But it literally, I think it stayed underneath. Like the feet, like I think it lives underneath the field. It lives underneath the stadium or underneath the turf of the field. And it's, I guarantee you, it's still there. And it probably has a family, a family Dude. of 12. And yeah. they probably just roam underneath the turf at, at the College of Charleston. Patriots point. How do it's snakes insane. reproduce? Are they eggs, guys? Or how does that oh, work? Oh, yeah. Eggs for sure. Eggs for sure. I, I think I would be, I, I'm, I'm not cool with snakes. Like, I would be no, so scared. No, no. 
Yep. 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 I could live my whole life never seeing one. Yeah. I, I, I don't mind. I, I don't mind spiders. Uh, I don't mind any kind of like critter. If it's a possum or raccoon, it doesn't rat? matter. How about a, a what? Rat? How about a rat? Yeah, dude, I don't care. I'll kill a rat. I'll kill really? a rat in front of my mom. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. Kill a rat. I don't, I don't touch the snakes. Dude, I'll tell you this. I, people might look at me differently. There is, I think I have a fear bigger than snakes and it, it's wasps. I, I cannot do wasps. I, I hate them more than anything in the world. I will run away. If I'm walking in the grass and I see a wasp, I will run away. Is this, it, it's, is this it's the embarrassing. 11? I can't, I is can't the, control it. <laughs> is this the 11.7 true circle? Do you know what my biggest fear is? Like uh, I really don't. A lefty throw in 95. Oh, dude, a righty throw an 84 with a changeup was a big fear. <laughs> Stop it. A lefty 95, of course. Uh, no. Uh, lightning. I really oh. don't like lightning. Like, I really don't like it. That's a good yeah. one. I, I love for lightning. Those that know me. Yeah, I worked on the water for a long time, so I've seen some crazy stuff. So, like, I don't mind it from being inside. But, like, if I'm outside during a lightning storm, like, you will see me completely lock up. Like, I get you, real scared. You're under a blanket. Do you need a – uh... <laughs> Shout out to Ted. Uh, do you need a thunder yeah. buddy? Who's your thunder buddy? Thunder, not a problem. It's when those bolts start crackling, man. You got no clue where they're going. Say, dude, same with wasps. You have no idea where they're flying. They're just buzzing around, it's looking the fear to sting. Of the uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. This is the the eleven point seven true circle. I want everyone who's listening tweet at the boys. I want to know your biggest fear. If we're gonna be a family, I want I want to like really we, break down these walls. I mean, it's, it, it just had to be said. I've been, I've been holding that in for a long time. And as a baseball player that plays usually in the summertime, like growing up summertime in Texas, playing in fields that were just not mowed, there were just wasps everywhere. And you would just, I mean, you'd be playing the outfield and there would be one just like buzzing past your eyes and or like landing on you. And dude, I, I might be a little girl, but the stings, they hurt not, at least for me. I hate them. So yeah, just never, uh, never going to be a wasp guy. I can't get over that fear. But anyways, I don't know if my, uh, if my connection just went out or if Jack's went out, but we're just going to keep rolling with this thing. Um, we have a big weekend ahead and the, uh, the weekend consists of six series. I mean, obviously way more than six series, but we, we focus on six series and we'll do our weekend series, pick them here in just a second. Hopefully going to get Jack back on, um, unless it's my Wi-Fi. It, it could be his. It could be mine. But I'm going to keep running with the show. But anyway, so I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, so if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Thank you for subscribing and watching on YouTube. Last episode, I got, I think we got over like 500 views. But anyways, th this is our six series for the six series. We can, uh, the weekend series pick them. We, we pick some fun ones. And if you got stuck around last episode, you heard us trying to decide you know, which series to, uh, to put in, which ones to take out. Funny enough, I, I told Dimitri, I did not want to see Oregon USC in the weekend series pick them. And of course it's shaping up to be like one of the biggest weekends or one of the, ser one of the biggest series this weekend. Uh, but anyways, we got Wright state at Northern Kentucky, the battle of the horizon right now. Uh, it, two teams that both will probably be dangerous four seeds. I don't I don't see anybody other than these two winning the conference. And uh, we'll dive into the series here in a little bit more in just a second. But I'm really excited to watch this one. Like, as a mid-major guy through and through, I think both of these teams have the capability of, of beating a one seed in regional. So this will play a big, a big part into uh, conference tournaments there. Uh, of course, we got the Egg Bowl. Mississippi State at Ole Miss. That's always a huge one. Uh, the two teams have been a little bit better this year as Jack rejoins. Um, Jack, you didn't know if it was my connection or your connection, so I just kept going with the show. Dude, um, guys, can I can I truth circle? I open up yeah. about being scared of lightning, and we are in a massive storm here in the low country in Charleston, South Carolina. I, I am not kidding you. I think we just got struck by lightning. We literally just lost power. And the only reason that like I'm on now, our Wi-Fi is turning back on, a little hot spot on the phone. But if I'm going to sit here and tell you that if you don't believe in anything, believe in this. I'm very scared of lightning. Someone heard and just bolted my ass. Ah, oh, man. Dude, <laughs> our father, Lord in heaven. <laughs> he just heard exactly what you said. Hey, watch this, Jack. 
Watch this. How about be by midweek? Let's go. <laughs> Um, all right, man. What did I miss? What did I miss? Uh, you missed me hyping up the right state at Northern Kentucky series. Uh, right now we're on the Egg Bowl, Mississippi State at Ole Miss. Um, this is going to be a fun one. I think there's going to be a lot of beer showers. There's probably going to be a couple fights in the stands. But overall, like you, you get South Carolina at Clemson. Uh, that I mean, that's probably the, one of the biggest rivalries, in my opinion, the biggest rivalry in college baseball. This one's right behind it. Mississippi State, Ole Miss, long history. Two really impressive stadiums that they alternate back and forth every year, and, and two former champions. Like they both have won. Mississippi State won in 2021. Ole Miss won in 2022. Uh, they've both been pretty bad since then, but both teams, Mississippi State especially, has been surprisingly good this year. So, um, what are your thoughts here on the Egg Bowl? Well, I think two teams that are like you mentioned historically what they have meant to the game of college baseball. When you think back to those Palmero and Will Clark teams that made those Omaha runs. And I think the energy that Ole Miss brought to the game, like in the late 2000s, like early 2010 decade, like I feel like it made college baseball cool. You know what I mean? Like it it was like, hey, like if I'm on a college campus, it made it fun to want to go and support your 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 college's team. And um I think two teams that have helped set the president in this game that's grown immensely and still is weekend and weekend out. Um, like even look at what happened at Penn state earlier this week, like not necessarily a college baseball school like that you would kind of think of, but you guys tweeted out from the admin account where they broke attendance records, hot dog sales through the roof. They broke those as well. Like these are the two teams in my mind, why their rivalry is I think at the top of our game is because you now see schools of power five prominent nature like a Penn State growing to almost emulate what they started decades ago. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you put Ole Miss or really Mississippi State, LSU, Texas, uh, they were the the crop that came in like after this USC, UCLA, Long Beach State, Wichita States. Um, but yeah, Ole Miss saw what Mississippi State was doing every weekend at, at I, I believe it was called Duty Noble Stadium back then. I, I think they call this one the new dude because of that. But if it's not if if the stadium where they were parking the trucks behind the outfield bleachers was not duty noble, forgive me. I just that's what I think it is. Anyways, but I think Ole Miss saw what Mississippi State was doing and how successful they were, and they also looked down to LSU and Alex Box, and Ole Miss decided to invest in college baseball heavily, like I believe early two thousands, and they build Swayze and they basically give the um, they basically give the student section free reign. Hey, no rules. You can go out there and um, and drink beer. You can throw the beer on yourself. You can grill out, cook. And with the arms race that there was, in, especially in the state of Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, between Southern Miss, LSU, Louisiana Lafayette in the early 2000s, like they really all brought the culture up uh, with college baseball. So this series is important. Um and not only for bragging rights, not only for SEC standings, um, but also like recruiting uh, coaches' hot seats. This is a big series for both Lamonis and Bianco. So I, I would I, I would be very very surprised if I don't watch all 27 innings. Really, uh, there might be a chance where if there's a blowout, like I might turn the channel. But I just as a college baseball fan and supporter, I always just watch this series, and I have since probably like 2010. So my thoughts are there. Uh, we got four other series, though. Don't look now, but the San Diego Toreros are playing really good baseball. And this is a program that schedules very hard non-conference to start the year. Um, I believe they played a weekend series Dallas Baptist against Texas. They played midweeks or maybe a weekend series against TCU. Um, and they do it to build up the RPI, but also like put themselves in position to get in at large if needed. They're playing at Portland, which Portland, the more I look into this program, the more like I think m the more I think mid-major programs should replicate what they're doing. The Portland Pilots went from an absolute nobody of a school baseball wise to one of the more respected schools on the West Coast. Uh, when when players go and sign to play baseball there, they're going to like they're expected to not only develop into, well, you know what? It's very similar to like what San Diego has been doing for the last 10 years or 15 years. 
Like Portland's getting these guys ready to go play pro ball, but at the same time trying to win baseball games. So uh, for the West Coast Conference to have a series like this uh, the week after college basketball finishes up is like prime time, perfect for this, uh, for not only college baseball fans, but like people out on the West Coast. So um, I don't know. I believe Portland is going to be broadcasting all the games on ESPN Plus, but if not, we'll find a way to watch it. Uh, but yeah, big series out West. Like this could be potentially for an at-large spot. Yeah, I, I think too. Like when you look at the Portland squad, they've gotten off to a quick start, especially six and own conference. But how do you not talk about what San Diego's done and like the postseason implications and what they've kind of experienced in like this transition and they've made it look seamless. Right. I, when I, when we, we've joked about San Diego and how have we not adjusted like kind of what you were able to break down. But it's a pure indictment to seeing all of these kids jumping from NAIA, D3, D2, and transfer portal their way into D1 spots and dominating immediately. Like you know, a name that comes to mind, like Jacob Ferentz at UVA right now, D3 at Salisbury, won a national championship at Salisbury. This 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 idea that, oh, I have to go D1 out of high school. Like, oh, that the D3 baseball is lesser than D1. The reason we're such mid-week, mid-major mid junkies is we understand that the, the discrepancy in talent between the Power 5 guy and the mid-major guy is slim. It's so slim, dude. The, the difference between the D1 kid and the D3 kid, the talent differential isn't slim. Sometimes it's just opportunity, right? Like, did I perform in front of the right guy at the right time? Jacob Ferentz broke the single-season home run record at Salisbury last year, D3 school in Maryland, and is now hitting in the cleanup spot for one of the best offenses in the country in UVA, tops in the ACC, tops in the country, a blue blood program. And, and that's how I view like San Diego making that D2 to D1 job. Like it's not necessarily about talent. Like it's just about opportunity for some of these teams. So that's going to be a really fun matchup and definitely familiarize yourself with those West Coast teams because I know that I've been trying to do a better job this year with it. Jack, I want to. Uh, I love what you said. I love the idea, but I think oh, you got your San Diego's mixed up. Is this not UC San Diego this weekend? No, this is this is Chris Bryant, San Diego Toreros. Oh, and he wasn't D one. Fuck. Me. Yeah, he was. Uh, you're you're thinking of, but like it brings up a good story, and I'm glad you brought it up because we we can talk about it. I think you brought up really good points about guys all across the country, D three legends that get to move up to the Division one level. Uh, Southern Miss, their, their weekend starter last year. He might still be back this year. I can't remember, but he won like a Division Three national championship and goes immediately into the Southern Miss's rotation. Um, but yes, but USC or sorry, USC San Diego or whatever they called um, UC San Diego. UC I, San Diego. I was getting when the we left, did our bonus submission on Sunday. That's right. Yeah, so the UC Tritons. San Diego. Yes, but they play. Irvine this weekend and I thought we were highlighting that matchup that's why I went on my monologue I prepared and you know what when you happens when you prepare you kicked in the ass that's what happened but I remember arguing that on Sunday night and getting lost in translation you know what's funny and why I love this show and the format of the show if this was any kind of like professional college baseball or MLB pod NFL even college football whatever we would just cut the segment out and you know pretend like it never happened but you brought up such good points that it was like, well, first of all, we don't cut any episodes just because we get lazy and we don't want to edit videos and podcasts. Um, but that's just kind of who we are. Like we're former college baseball players. One week, one time when I was uh, a junior, we were supposed to be playing at UNC Greensboro. And I remember thinking like, oh, we're going to go play Sanford this weekend, which is in a completely different state. Slept on the bus ride. We show up. And I remember getting in the dugout being like, where are we? This is not Sanford. And people were like, what are you talking about? Like, dude, we're playing Sanford this weekend, right? Like, no, we're playing UNC Greensboro for the SoCon championship. We played Sanford two months ago. So, um, yeah, we're college baseball players. We're, we're, if it's not in front of our face, we're probably not going to look at it or care about it. One take wonder. Yeah. Oh, no One take wonder. But anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll get into our picks here in just a second. Um, we got three other series. UCF, what a story this program's been. Uh, we I feel like we talk about UCF every single weekend, and they just continue to impress. Like they had one weekend where they slipped up, got swept at Oklahoma, but since then, I mean, they're eight and four in Big Twelve play. Big series wins, sitting at like number five in the RPI. 
prime position to host a regional if they finish strong, which would be huge for that team. Like they just moved up, not from D2 to D1, but from the American to the Big 12. So proud of them. West Virginia, I think, is about to go on a big roll here. Yeah. They, they get J.J. Weatherholt back, uh, win a huge series last weekend. And um, although they looked pretty bad in the midweek, like this feels like a time where West Virginia might take off. And they got all their talent healthy now. Next series, I might go to. Yeah. I, I would absolutely go to it if Dimitri was in the States. I don't know his schedule on who needs to be running like social media accounts, but Coastal Carolina at Georgia Southern, an hour down the road from me, big time matchup. Talking about two teams that have hosted regionals in the last two years. Georgia Southern 2022 hosted a regional. Coastal Carolina hosted one last year. And they look at each other. And first of all, both well coached by coaches that have been around for 20 plus years at each respective school. So like obviously like well coached, these two coaches know each other well, but we're talking about a team that relies on offense and offense and offense and another team that reply or that relies on defense, pitching, defense, pitching. So that'll be fun. I think the Georgia state like student or not Georgia state, Georgia Southern student section will be out live. I imagine that stadium is going to be pretty packed. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a fun one to watch. I think it's going to come down to Sunday. Like, I really do. I could see an 11 to 10 game on Saturday and a two to one game on Friday. So we'll see. And then, uh, last but not least Vanderbilt at Texas A&M is the last weekend series. Pick them. I mean, what do you want to say? They're both eight and four. Uh, Vanderbilt got swept at USC or, or South Carolina. And then Texas A&M lost two out of three to Florida. Other than that, like, these teams have been flawless all year, like really good talent, really well coached and kind of like old school baseball, right? Like they have, they have different mentality than I think a lot of other SEC teams, more of a military style. I mean, you get Tim Corbin, Jim Schlossnagel, two of probably the most popular coaches in college baseball, as far as the average college baseball fan has probably heard of both of them. And uh, I, I, I can't tell you how excited I am for this series too. So Good series all across the country, and um, we'll make our picks here, but I'll let you uh, have the closing thought on anything you want to preview for each one. No, I think I like. there's a lot of stud pitching in this slate, right? I yeah. think a and what, second in the country in Team ERA. UCF is like 25th. Um, and Georgia Southern, as you mentioned, I believe they're like top 30 in Team ERA. Uh, and they're all like Ben don't break spots against like offenses that have been like relentless as hell, right? Coastal one through nine. We've joked about how stance to swing all look mechanically the exact same. Vanderbilt offensively this year have showcased a little bit more power than maybe years past, where they've it's been kind of um a bloop and a blast has been kind of their their prototypical like game, like, hey, this is what we want to do. Just find a way to get it on and then drive dudes in. Um that West Virginia UCF one, I think, is the one I'm most excited for in a weird way. Uh, like, I want to see if West Virginia is the real or deal or not. Um, but yeah, yeah, let's roll them. So, um, obviously, there's a ton of other series, too. And we'll, so after we make our weekend series pick them, it's, it's a free firm. Like, we're going to be talking about other series, series that start tonight on Thursday. There's some big ones. And then just closing thoughts. So, we want to get this out of the way first. Dimitri's supposed to be texting his picks here in just a second. So, if they come through, uh, we'll let you know. But Wright State at Northern Kentucky. Battle the horizon. I, I truly think that the winner of this series will win the regular season and probably win the horizon tournament. Northern Kentucky has got some big wins this year. And, and Wright State has dominated this conference the last five or six years. So um, this one was tough for me. But when you look at each starting lineup, each solidified starting rotation and you just look at the resumes plus they're playing at home. The Norse feel like such an easy pick for me. And I'm the biggest right state guy out there. Like I picked the Raiders to win the regional at, at, at Indiana state last year, like plus 1100. I thought, I thought they had a legitimate chance to win it and they could have won game one. The bullpen kind of blew it in the eighth or ninth inning, um, but they were competitive but they did lose a lot from last year's team. Uh, I think Northern Kentucky gained a lot, uh, especially out of the portal. So give me the Norse. I think they're going to win here, um, especially at home. The name that you need to know, Liam McFadden Ackman. 12 Yahtzees on the year for Northern Kentucky. He, but he's he hit a bunch last year too. 
He's in 407 this year. Like we're already deep in the conference play. Um, I don't think there's, I know that Wright State, I, I know I mentioned the con- contrast to style, but like they're going to really throw it. Northern Kentucky, like, is kind of a Johnny Hole staff ball club. Like, they go to a lot of different bullpen arms. They try to eat up a lot of innings, but ERA is from like five to eight. But they understand that, like, if they get you into a shootout, they're going to beat you. Uh, that's why I like them at home. Northern Kentucky. Old dude. Perfect. All right. Next, we got Mississippi State at Ole Miss. I've never been more confident in an SEC series, okay? Really? Yeah, really. Ole Miss is going to win this series two out of three. And I cannot wait because I'm buddies with the uh, the SID at Mississippi State. Uh, he used to be at Mercer, and like him and I used to chop it up all the time. But anyways, like long story short, I can't wait for Mississippi State to cut this segment after they win the series and like dunk on 11.7, similar to what Georgia State did. But this series – is an absolute 100% must win for the Ole Miss Rebels. Not only for Coach Bianco, uh, not only for the guys that have, you know, basically struggled the last two seasons in the SEC, but like this is a pride series. Mississippi State's been playing great. They won two out of three last week against Georgia. Like they've been competitive uh, after last year's clunker. But when it's all said and done, like which team I think who has more grit. Who wants to defend the home? Uh, who wants to? Uh, I guess Ole Miss obviously wants to de- de- defend their home field, but like this is 100% pride. If Ole Miss does not win this weekend series, I think Bianco is on not just the hot seat, but the scorching hot seat. And but I think he does a good job of rallying his players and letting them know the situation, uh, similar to 2022, when they barely squeaked in the tournament and he had his players, um, you know. Uh, Elko and those guys like basically become men overnight. And this, this series screams Ole Miss in my head and I'm not fighting it. Give me the rebels at home. Yeah. I wasn't going to overthink this. I, I got Mississippi state should probably go ahead and queue up their hype video because I got a weird feeling. Dimitri's going to do the exact same thing. I'm not overthinking it when we went over it in that first SEC weekend. Like uh, th- this is a, the home field has always been dominated in the egg bowl. Like call your boy Mincy. Like this, this to me screams DK Metcalf lifting a leg and taking a piss on the rival. Like I think Andrew Fisher, who's leading that team with 13 homers and OPS over 1100, like he's going nuts. Uh, and to me, like, I just think this is the home team wins the rivalry. Like I, I don't really think it's that difficult. I think they get a win on Friday. I think they win Saturday too. I think the depth of Mississippi state beats them on Sunday pretty bad. But I think like the energy on Friday and Saturday um, gets them gets them a big time serious win. Uh, and then on top of that, like I've always had a giant man crush on Mike Bianco. Like those like pre and post game speeches he always gives. Like if you're a college baseball guy and you're not listening to those on repeat, like you have no pulse. Yeah, so the pre game speech is going to be exhilarating Friday night, as you as you mentioned. Like yeah, he might be on the hot seat, but I bet he doesn't feel it. Like he's just out with the boys having a good time, uh, and that's why they win this weekend. Yeah, and, and one more thing before the Mississippi State fans like come after me, you should be kissing me at my feet that I'm picking Ole Miss in this series because <laughs> there has been over the last six years or the last six seasons, I think I've picked Mississippi State in 80% of our weekend series pick them options. And they're probably hitting it 20% when I pick them. So I'm doing y'all a favor by picking by picking Ole Miss, even though I'm gonna pick Ole Miss either way. Um, Mississippi State fans do not come after me. I'm doing you a huge favor. This is giving you at least an extra five runs to score this weekend by me picking Ole Miss. <laughs> um, let me let me watch Cam Smith make this birdie putt real quick. Um, as long as I love the Australian. Point. Do you want me to just go ahead and kick it off while you're watching? Yeah, Matthew? kick it off, kick it off, unless he misses Portland, it. Portland, San Diego. If you've been listening this whole episode, you knew that I was anticipating you see San Diego. So I know nothing about this matchup. What is going to be done by the Portland? I don't know their full names, but I'll tell you, it's a really cool pilots. logo. Is it the Pilots? Sweet yeah. logo. It's an anchor with uh, with like a, the, the captain's wheel uh, around it. Um, I don't know a ton about San Diego. I do know Chris Bryant dominated there. Uh, give me Portland at home. The Pilots. I just learned your uh, nickname. All on board. Yeah, the uh, the pilots are a good pick here, but 
um, when I when it comes to mid major baseball and well, I'm gonna say especially mid major baseball, things usually don't they don't go off course. For the most part, certain teams beat certain teams every single year, and it's just like in the identity of mid major baseball. It doesn't matter if you're playing in the SoCon or the Southland or you know the the WAC. The teams that are usually better win almost every single time. And like San Diego has been proven that since Chris Bryant was there in like 2012. Um, San Diego is the West Coast Conference, uh, Houston Astros or whoever. Like just every year you just look at them, you're like, wow, this is a team that's well coached. They got the same style players and they win weekend series in the West Coast Conference. So I'm taking the Toreros. Um, I love the pilot story. I just want to see them get a big series win so I can be fully bought in on them. So I, I, I don't think San Diego on the road is a big deal. They've been doing it all spring. So give me the Toreros. Um, hey, man, I learned something new every day. Can I ask another dumb question before we move on? What's up? If they're the pilots, why why is it an anchor? Are they Jack. like – Jack, this is crazy that you ask, and people that listened to the show last year yeah. are going to have deja vu because I asked that exact same question last season, and Dimitri made me feel like an idiot. He was Ooh. like, how do you not know that the person that is on the boat that's driving the boat is no. called a pilot no. or whatever? Oh, not true. I don't remember his answer, but this exact question happened last season. <laughs> and Dimitri made me feel like an idiot. So thank God he's not on this episode because right. he would be making you feel like an idiot right now. Well, then I had been a, the pen pencil talk dilemma would have gone back and forth. I've worked on a boat my entire life. It's a boat captain. Now That's there is a, it's a boat captain. Now there is a harbor pilot that is like when you think about like the upper echelon, like a CEO of a company, the harbor pilot basically maintains and oversees anything that comes in and out of the harbor. Um, I'm not going to overthink this, but I, it seems like a stretch to me. I just think that Portland wanted a little alliteration. They wanted to go PP on us. All right. So I just I just searched on Twitter because this was a big topic. Uh, February love- 24th, 2023. Okay. And uh, I, I mentioned something about... All right. Jeff Holt. One who drives a boat is called the pilot. It's also used as a verb for the action of driving a boat. I would hope that all who know would be happy to educate those who don't. A proper boat has a bow, which is the front of the boat. Bonus, yeah. a coracle is only a temporary bow. And then a bunch of other people replied with riverboat pilots, riverboat pilots, riverboat pilots. So, so February 23rd of last year was when this came up on the pod. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked again because you just reminded me. Well, I'm glad that I could. Well, that's love, right? I'm reading your mind. But I'm telling you, maybe it's an East and West Coast thing. I'm a little bit of a nautical nerd. Been working on boats my whole life. Shout out to Tidal Wave and Captain Cocktail. Looking for a bachelor bachelorette party. Come jump on boat with me this summer, probably. Got to find a way to thin the linings of this wallet before we go spend it all in Omaha. But no shot. It's boat captain. I know that there's a hard pilot. Yeah, I'm with you. We're smarter than everybody. On to the next. On to the next. Um, UCF Knights at West Virginia. Um, another series that I think is easy for me. I'm taking West Virginia. Listen, you go from Orlando, Florida to Morgantown, West Virginia. There's some culture shock. Um, West Virginia is going to pro- probably sell out the stadium this weekend. And these guys that are playing in Orlando, sure, UCF has an awesome crowd and they get rowdy. But when West Virginia fans are invested in their sports team, think about football. Think about basketball. Think about the heydays. And they finally have a baseball team. Uh, I, I believe 2019 they with Alec Manoa and them, like they hosted a regional. But they were heavily invested in that team, and it's the same vibes this year. Um, this is going to be a special atmosphere. And I think West Virginia goes in and not only wins the series, I think they're going to sweep. I think J.J. Weatherholt's going to give them a spark that that is going to propel them to a sweep. So, um. UCF looked really bad that opening series uh, weekend against Oklahoma in Big 12 play, and I, I kind of expect the same thing. It's just a different atmosphere up there in Morgantown. 
it's hard to believe like Central Florida and West Virginia are in the same conference. Like that's hard to like imagine, and, and it's going to be really hard for them. I, I got to imagine they're jumping on a plane, but to fly up to Morgantown, which will be a hostile environment, weather hold back. But the name to me that everyone needs to know. Derek Clark is a southpaw for West Virginia. He missed, like, I think the first three weeks of the year. He's making his sixth start of the season. Don't quote me on this, I believe, and if he wasn't, that's a travesty. He should have been the Big 12 pitcher of the week. I believe he was. But he went nine innings, gave up three hits, and he's a D2 transfer, right? Yeah. Stud from Northwood University. And he is the, like, I think the biggest myth in college baseball is you have to throw 90 plus mile per hour to play division one baseball and to do it effectively. This is a four pitch mix. He's crafty as hell. I think he sets the tone and quiets UCF bats because I think we all know that weather Holt and company like hitting is contagious as hell. Well, it's just as contagious on the mound too. Um, I think they get it rolling. I think I was really high on Kansas state because of the star power. Um, and that two or three guys can will them to a Big 12 championship because it feels like that year in the Big 12 where nobody's going to be too dominant. I'm starting to see like the two three-headed monster in Morgantown. So I'm with you. I think this is a no-brainer. I don't know if that guarantees a UCF series win, but this feels like if if I had to pick them still alive, this would be my pick of the week. Yeah, me too. If I had a survivor, I would probably go with this one too. I know Dimitri's going to take UCF, I think. I mean, he's usually pretty high on UCF. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope it's a good weekend series and like, obviously like Friday will dictate the rest of the series, but I just don't see any other way. Like, I think West Virginia knows this is a series that they can, first of all, jump majorly in the RPI with a sweep. And, um, nobody really is. I mean, I think the big 12 is pretty as open as any other conference right now. Like it's bundled up at the top and, and West Virginia can separate themselves. Um, they're eight and four. UCF eight and seven in Big Twelve play. So, with a two out of three, you're looking at ten and five versus uh, nine and nine. Yeah, UCF would be at five hundred. So big, big series there in Morgantown. Next series here, we got Coastal Carolina at Georgia Southern. I don't know what to do with this one, man. Like I really don't. I think if you asked me on Monday, I would say Georgia Southern. If you asked me on Tuesday, I would say Coastal. If you asked me on Wednesday, I would say Georgia Southern. Today, I don't know what I want. Uh, if you want to pick first, go for it. But this one was the toughest series for me by far. I feel good about this one. Um, only because all year we said that there were two, three teams in the Sun Belt that felt like they were going to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. And it's still a jumbled mess. I expect Coastal to separate themselves from the pack this week. Uh, Georgia Southern at eight and four in the Sun Belt. Uh, Coastal sits right there in third. Um, or excuse me, in fourth as Georgia Southern's tied for second place uh, with Southern Miss. To me, this is a statement weekend for Coastal Carolina. Like, I don't know the powers that are to be of Zen Mountain, which you've already been to Georgia Southern. Zen Mountain out in right field is about as electric as the, as you'll find. But to me, this is a Coastal Carolina weekend where Caden Bodine and, and company kind of roll in and go, all right, like we're going to try to post 10 runs a game. Uh, Cameron Fluky, Coastal's back end guy, I think has a really good weekend and kind of like makes his impact felt as a big time 95 plus dude out of the back end. And I think he's got to throw in all three games. Like, I think he's got to give him an inning or two in all three games. Um, I, I think this is Coastal Carolina. Yeah. Uh, I, man, dude, this is so <laughs> tough. I look, so for those that don't know, Georgia Southern's got an awesome field. Uh, they have a, a big blue monster in right field. So think Boston Red Sox, Fenway Park, turn it blue and put it in right field. Uh, short porch, Coastal's got a ton of lefty bats. So if they can get the ball up in the air, which they usually do, I mean, they hit these moonshot home runs with their wiffle ball swings. A lot of lefties in the order. Like, Coastal should be fine. I, I'm such a big proponent. or I always say, like, in college baseball, a good offense will beat a good pitching staff more times than not. Coastal's got the offense, but Georgia Southern's pitching. They play well at home. They've been playing really well recently, too. I'm going to go with Georgia Southern. Like I, It makes no sense because it's against everything I talk about, but I just have this gut feeling that Georgia Southern's like a much better team than their 16-14 and 14 record, um, or 18-14 and 14 record. I, I've been high on them all year, like since the preseason. Uh, this is a team that hosts a regional in 2022, had a down year last year. I think they're going to bounce back strong this year. Coastal Carolina usually doesn't play well on the road. We saw that against App State. Uh, 
I'm going to take Georgia Southern, uh, but I think it's going to come down to Sunday, which scares me because Coastal Carolina can put up 20 runs on a Sunday. <laughs> they uh, I, This could be a Zach Beach weekend too. Like he's been really good. I think he moved himself into sixth all time in home runs um, at Coastal. I, this feels like a weekend where he could hit, you know, I, I don't know, like three or four on the weekend being that big lefty bat. Um but you did. You had Georgia Southern in your Omaha eight, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Come on, never a doubt. Ride or die. <laughs> Anyways, um, Vanderbilt at Texas A and M last weekend series pick them. I, I I think this series is a lot easier to pick than uh, what it looks like. I mean, of course, you got like Vanderbilt who just comes off a series win against LSU. Texas A and M's been rolling this whole year, but guys, something special about College Station right now. The Blue Bell Park has been rocking. The fans have been into it all year. This is a group where, you know, I, I talked to the, the assistant coaching staff a week before the season um, who we're pretty close with at 11.7, like all the assistants over at Texas A&M. And one of them, I'm not going to say exactly who it was, but one of the three assistants that we talked to was like, listen, you got to trust me. This is an Omaha team. Yeah. Like this is a team that is going to be special in the SEC. We're built to win weekend series. And in my opinion, they have the two best players on the field. And no matter what Vanderbilt throws out there, Texas A&M has the two best players on the field, maybe the top three best players on the field. So give me Texas A&M. Don't let me down, Aggies. But I, I think Texas A&M wins this series and like puts themselves in the conversation of, yeah, we're up there with Arkansas. Like, yeah, we're up there with Clemson, Oregon State, like, I know the ranking is there, but this is going to be a big statement series win in College Station. So give me the Aggies. Yeah, Bryce Cunningham for Vanderbilt has to be really, really good. Like you can't make mistakes against this AM offense. So if he can go get a win and then get, you know, anything can happen on a Sunday. Uh, to me, though, I it feels like Braden Montgomery, there's no slowing that bad man down right now. Like we we joked about it on the last pod. He feels like a top three pick the way that he carries himself, the way that he mm -hmm. handles himself. But the reason I'm so high on this Aggie team, and it might sound trivial, uh, baseball is about having fun and, and the fungo golf squad and what they're putting together as just as authentic of content you'll find in the college baseball world today. And they're not doing it because it's doing well, but they're doing it because it's a blast and they're ripping on each other and they're making fun of each other. Like the leader of the fungo squad, you have to go follow him on Twitter. Like every time Braden Montgomery hits a home run, like, I don't know, man, I, this kid hasn't shown the ability to hit line drives and keep the ball on the ground. Like, I, I think that's a major red flag at the next level. They're hilarious. And it's why, like, to your point, not only they're super talented where every time they step foot on the field, they know that they have the best player in the country, but they're really funny. And, like, they're having a blast. Um, similar to the West Virginia series, like, to me, this feels like it could be grab your brooms, it's a mess sweep. But – I mean, Tim Corbin doesn't get swept often, but I, I like the Aggies. Yeah. Um, I just got the text. Dimitri made his pick, so I know everybody's wondering. He goes Wright State, Mississippi State, San Diego, UCF, Coastal, and Texas A&M. So five visiting teams <laughs> and then Texas A&M. So if I'm not mistaken, congratulations to Vanderbilt. Yep. For winning the weekend series, we all picked Texas A&M. So uh, Vanderbilt, good job this weekend. Uh, great series win at Texas A&M. Well done. Also, no, I think, I think no, that's the only I think one we're good. Had. Yeah, that's yeah. the only one. Because we both had more Vanderbilt. Yeah. Nice. But anyways, uh, that was the weekend series pick. Em. There's a few other series I want to talk about, and now it's really just going to be a free for all. I know Jack and I have to get off here in a little bit, but. We got some series on uh, starting today, and so when I say today, I mean Thursday. You know, every every Thursday, there's a couple SEC, a couple ACC series um, that start Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I love it, but the one that I have circled, this is like, this is the Ben Upton, please get it done series of the week. <laughs> I've been talking up this Miami team about how they need a hostile environment to play good. And that they're much better than their record says. And that they're going to make a three seed at, at the Arkansas Regional and win it. Like, I've been making some preposterous claims out there. But I truly do believe it. Guess what? Miami is going to Florida State. A team that just absolutely whooped up on Florida uh, on Tuesday. Just an impressive all-around performance. 
But Florida State, Dick Hauser Stadium is going to be rowdy. And these Miami Hurricanes players who are young, feisty, swaggy, like this is the time to show up and win a series. I know it sounds crazy. Nobody thinks it's going to happen. I think this Miami team is going to win the series this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, at Florida State. And if they don't, I will admit I'm wrong and I'm the stupidest person in the world. But they will absolutely thrive on this rowdy atmosphere at Dick Hauser Stadium. I like it. When you asked for some mayhem. That would be it. Um, I don't know. It's Florida almost State a must-win play. series for them. Like if they want to be in a like a postseason picture, like you win a series at number ten, Florida State. Like that's that's is one of the best resume builders you can have. So yeah. There's some fun ones, man. I, outside of uh, Kentucky, Auburn, they tip off tonight as well. Georgia, Missouri, they tip off. Let me tell you about Kentucky, Auburn. Hit me. Auburn, Auburn just lost an embarrassing midweek game, three to two, to Alabama yeah. State. Kentucky, eleven and one in the SEC. So it, it's literally the best team in the SEC, like record wise, other than Arkansas. But Kentucky, eleven and one. Auburn, ten and two. Or sorry, two and ten. It's at Auburn. It would not surprise me one bit if Auburn won the series. Like that's how evenly balanced I think the SEC is. You get a team that's eleven and one. In fact, let me pull it up here on DraftKings what the line is tonight. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I bet it's a lot closer than what you think. For I bet really? it's probably like uh, Kentucky minus one fifty. No, it's gotta uh, be two. Kentucky minus one sixty six. Auburn plus one thirty. It, it's, dude, it's close, man. Like, I'm telling you, Auburn wins this series. It puts them at 4-11. and 11. You're kind of right back in it. Like If you win a couple more series in a row, like you can you can fight to get to Hoover and give, your ch- give yourself a chance. But <laughs> I think this formula of losing an embarrassing midweek game, just saying, all right, we have the number eight team in the country coming to our park. Let's defend it. I, it would not surprise me one bit if Auburn won this series. While we're playing that fun game, guess that line. My big series, and I think it's I, – I just love the team when everyone backs out backs out off of you. I love it, right? Like, it's not even backs against the wall. Like, they just forgot about you. LSU goes to Knoxville and beats Tennessee this weekend. Yeah. Oh, they dude, I think, I think that's on a lot of people's radars. Really? Right? Well, What's no, I, I'm What's not discrediting what you said. Like, I think that's a very firm take, and, like, that is a good take. But – like LSU is way too good to be three and nine. And although I, I'm a huge fan of this Tennessee team, I think they're yeah. as dangerous as they come. It, it's like something's got to give with this LSU team where they, they hit 500 as a team on the weekend and, and put up 10 runs in every single game. Like it's, they're due to, it's due to happen. So you get a good head friendly ballpark in, in Lindsey Nelson stadium. I could see it where LSU just outslugs Tennessee. But if it's, like, if it's on radar, I want out then. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's radar, but I think there's a lot of people expecting LSU to like bounce back finally, and it's yeah. a good spot for them to bounce back. I don't know. This this Tennessee team is so fun because it's a different name every weekend. You know what I mean? Like it's a different oh, yeah. guy in that lineup that beats you. And in years past, it felt like the star power. Not to say that this team doesn't have it. Like. Blake Burke is a bona fide superstar. He just broke this um, Tennessee home run record. Like, there are stars. I'm just saying it feels like that this team has the parity in their lineup, that it, it is a different dude every week. That's why I felt like everyone's like, oh, wait, Tennessee's like the real deal. And then LSU goes up and takes two from them. Griffin Herring, a southpaw on the back end of that LSU bullpen, has really kind of emerged as maybe he's like that Riley Cooper candidate from a year ago where he can go and get big time outs and big time moments. His stuff is really gross, so I, I like LSU. But uh, there is a series that I want to take note of. We trashed them. We said it was their World Series. I in the, our Sun Belt. Uh, I want to see if Texas State can respond and get back into the mix of the Sun Belt. They're five and seven. They just won their World Series yet again against Texas last night. They beat up on the Longhorns to take the uh, season series at two to three. Uh, they've got ULM this weekend. At ULM, three and nine, bottom of the barrel of the Sun Belt. Can Texas State get it back going? I would bet not. I, I would bet that it's another Longhorn uh, hangover. Um, but I'm curious. Like I, we're mid-major guys, so I, I've got to monitor the Bobcats because I'm in love with them a little bit. But I'm let it, I'm ready to be let down again. 
Yeah, no, I mean that's a uh, that's a great series to circle too because like Texas State, like the, they're similar to LSU, much like much more talented than what the record says, and like you just never know every year. Like college baseball is such a great sport because you can get hot in April and it can stay until June. You know what I mean? Like you can put yourself in position right now to get back in the postseason. But um, yeah, I mean Texas State, like we saw it ar- earlier. Like when they win a big game against Texas, like there's a big hangover. So maybe this was the the end of the hangover. Maybe they really get things going. But like that's a series that like it, Texas State could put themselves back at least yeah. in consideration um, for like you know a five four or five seed in the Sun Belt tournament. Uh, they're still a long ways off though. So far, um, a few other series here that maybe isn't on a ton of people's radars, but I think are very 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 important. Cincinnati at Oklahoma State, you might say, like, why is that an important series? Well, guess what? They're both 7-5 and five in the Big 12. Cincinnati just swept TCU. Oklahoma State just won the series against their rival Oklahoma. Like, one of them has to win the series this weekend, right? And if you build back-to-back weekend series wins, like, that can take you very far because it solidifies the lineup, solidifies the pitching staff. Like, you can run with that team and, like, everybody knows, like, what the goal is. Um, so like, that's a very important series just for the mind uh, of not only the players, but the coaches as well. There's also, um, South Carolina at Florida, South Carolina, huge midweek, uh, win against, uh, North Carolina on Tuesday, Florida gets embarrassed on Tuesday and Florida has been embarrassed multiple times. But if you're a Florida Gator fan, you win this weekend series, you're eight and seven in the sec. Like it doesn't matter what else is going on. Like you're gonna still be in the in the postseason picture, um, so, but if you're South Carolina, you get a weekend series win on the road at Florida, that does wonders for a team's morale. So I'm I'm really excited about that series too. Obviously Arkansas at Alabama, um, Alabama's just got to find a way to not get swept, because five and ten in the SEC is completely different than four and eleven. Four and eleven, you're playing with fire. Like you need probably two sweeps to like get into at large territory. So uh, it's at Alabama. They've been playing pretty bad baseball lately. Maybe they bounce back and and win a game against Arkansas. But right now, Arkansas looks like a well-oiled machine. Like no one's stopping them. They're so. And then the last series, Virginia at Louisville. Louisville six and six in the ACC. They get Virginia at home. And although I think there's going to be a million runs scored, I mean, Louisville's kind of played their way back into uh, the thick of things in the ACC. I've been very impressed with how they've been playing. They, they just got a weekend sweep over NC State. The week before that, they played Florida State really tough. Um, I, I don't know. Like, and, and the schedule kind of lightens up a little bit towards the end of the year for Louisville. So I think this is an important series in the ACC. Uh, Virginia 9-6. and six. Like It's not like they're... 12 and four or anything like nine and six is right there with six and six technically. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's any other series and I've got a couple not. pretty key fun ones. Like if you look at the ACC's whole, like it's like, it's really the top of the echelon versus kind of the bottom of the barrel. Like, and maybe we see a couple upsets where you scratch your head a little bit. Like the one in the middle, that Virginia tech, Georgia tech series will be a lot of fun. Like Georgia Tech, I believe they're five and seven. The ACC opportunity to get back up over five hundred if they can go get a sweep with a Virginia Tech team coming off a little bit battered against Wake Forest, who's clearly woken up. But can I give you my freaky fun one? I mean, this one's weird. We didn't talk about it in the midweek upset, but how about La Tech going and beating the Raging Cajuns this weekend? Right, that was big. This, this midweek, not necessarily an upset. I bet La Tech is like, yeah, we're right in that game. Uh, your hypothetical financial investment would saw him as a dog. Um, but La Tech beating the Cajuns, who were rolling 15 in a row. They stutter up, not worried about the Cajuns. But Louisiana Tech goes to Arizona this weekend. Yeah, that's right? a fun one. I forgot about that. Almost made the weekend series pick him. It's a freaky fun one because it's it's kind of a throwaway series in the sense that, like, oh, it's a non-conference. But La Tech, who got out to that big-time undefeated start, who their RPI is sitting at like 72 right now. If you can go beat the leader of the Pac-12 in a weekend series, 
that says a ton to the committee. It says a, a ton about Conference USA. So that's a big time weekend for those guys coming off a huge win against the Cajuns. Um, so I've got my eye on that one. I'm really excited about that weekend set. The Pac-12 too. I know we kind of talked about USC Oregon as well. Um, but I, I, that one I think is really fun because I know it doesn't have total implications for Arizona, but I mean, Arizona's 18 and 13 on the year. Like, it's not like they're yeah. sitting super comfortable, right? Like they need to go and win this weekend. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I forgot to make my bonus pick too. The battle of the valleys. We, uh, there, there the last go. episode we, we got it. Me and Demetri got into it. I really wanted Utah Valley at UT Rio Grande Valley on the weekend series pick them. And, uh, it's just because like I love UT Rio Grande's uh, Rio Grande Valley's broadcast. Uh, they have a nice stadium. They usually get a really big crowd. Uh, not much to do down there, and I, I forget what town in Texas they're in, but maybe Edinburgh or something like that. But anyways, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a pick. I'm gonna say Utah Valley wins that series. I think they go on the road and win it. Um, that's my bonus pick for the Valley, the Valley Bowl. I like it. And then. I'm a big- um, Another big series that at the mid major level, like Troy is on the road at App State, and Troy seven and five in Sun Belt, like not where we thought they would be through twelve game or twelve games in the Sun Belt, but App State is feisty, man. Uh, I watched them play against Coastal on that Sunday, that was and crazy. was like, dude, this team is a lot better than like people are giving yeah. them credit. Like App State can really play baseball. They got a couple good arms and very offensive team, so. It's almost a must-win series for Troy. They've put themselves in that position uh, as probably a preseason favorite to win the Sun Belt. And uh, I don't know if they're going to do it. Like I, I hope they do, but I don't know if Troy's going to win that series. It, it's going to be a tough one up there in Boone. Uh, so that was the last the last series that really draws my attention. But as you guys know, like as the weekend develops, there'll be yeah. some series that pop up that were like, ooh, this is interesting. Like maybe Pitt is is wins the first two games against UNC or whatever. Like there'll be some more drama building up, but as far as the podcast goes, Jack, I'll let you have the final words. Anything else that, uh, that comes to mind? Any, any hole in one so far? I haven't seen any. I just watched Cam Smith show up like 30 feet shy. So I'm feeling good about that. The hole in one, no hypothetical investment still looking strong. Um, oh, I do want to bring up, I have a final Sunbelt guy. I know we brought up coastal and Georgia Southern because they're, you know, it's really pivotal from seating standpoint. Um, I have to bring up Georgia State again. I, that video where they clip the boys, I so electric, like that I need to make sure that we throw some more flowers at the lot. My boy, Max Ryerson, who I played with, shows my age a little bit. It was an All-American for him last year. Had a conversation with him. 20-plus homer guy in both seasons at Georgia State. They're getting ready for Southern Miss to roll into town this weekend. And I know Southern Miss fans are still upset at us for not, like, showing enough love to the boys. I know Dalton McIntyre's off to a crazy blistering yeah. start. Hitting over 400. is always on base. Um that one I'm really excited for, and I wanted to give either team a little bit of clickbait, build some highlights around us. Um, I think, ready? I think Georgia State wins the series. They're 7-5 in the Sun Belt. Go and win the series at home against Southern Miss. Let the Southern Miss fans build a highlight reel around me talking shit because I think it would be a lot of fun. I, I, I think you're crazy, dude. I had a little FOMO. That's all. I had a little FOMO. Defend the law. You want the adrenaline rush of like picking against a team, like having the hope of a highlight reel. Look, I'm going to tell you this right now. I've been to a lot of, of Southern Miss games over my years. That's where my brother went. Uh, I played against Georgia State, I think, five times in my career. This is just like, it, it, it goes back to my rule of thumb. In mid-major baseball, typically the same teams that win every year, win every year. And I just Southern Miss doesn't lose these type of series. I know it's on the road. It would be an absolute lock if it was in Hattiesburg, but yeah. just yeah. Southern Miss ain't losing this series, dude. It, it you ain't have to bring your own juice. You have to bring your own juice to this series, right? Yeah, I that's think, true. I will say this, all kidding aside, I know Southern Miss fans are going to hate me for that one. I really do need to make it Hattiesburg. I, I know you and, and oh, little bro have talked about Special, dude. Special dude, like place. the super videos from last year, like it does look super stupid. Like it looks like a lot of fun. So maybe we make a trip. Okay. I'm Southern down. Miss fans, Southern Miss fans, hear us out. Find some local restaurants, sp- companies that'll sponsor the boy to come out. Ben and, I, ben and I are flying out. Every video we do, we'll put y'all's watermark just over our faces. 
and we'll have a good time. I want to experience Hattiesburg for the first time. Come on. There's a lot just- of good local restaurants, dude. I'm telling you. And like, I mean, just tons of like locally owned businesses. Hattiesburg is still kind of in like the 1980s, 1990s. And I say that in a good, like a good way. Like it's, it's small town feel. It's such a college town. Like everything revolves around the college. Um, but the, the locals are like diehard fans. So like football game days, it, it gets packed around the stadium. Um, baseball is a special atmosphere, but yeah, like you get mug shots and, uh, I'm trying to think of a few other places. My brother used to take me, um, there's a, there's a pretty sick bar. That's like a warehouse. I can't think of what it's called. See how uh, easily you've already got me fired up. I'm so easily bribed and persuaded. Like, get yeah, the boys I mean, out of this Southern Miss will win the Natty. Let's go. I just need to experience it. Yeah, we'll just stay at Coach Barry's house. We'll call him up. Coach Barry, I know you're retired, but you got an extra room. We'll we'll bunk together. I'll bring my own sleeping bag. Yeah. Anyways, um, good episode today. Dimitri should be back Sunday night. And uh, But this was fun. Like This kind of reminded me of Club Romaha a little bit, which we need to get oh. back on. we just both been busy. Busy schedules. Let's get it going this weekend. Yep. All right. Um, everybody, appreciate you for listening. And uh, we'll see you guys Sunday night.